everyone. My name is Claire Patton and welcome to Discovering Digital Humanities with the Oklahoma State University Library. Today I'm here with Dr. Louise Siddons and we're going to be talking about her art history class and the project that she's been working on for this past semester. How are you doing Dr. Siddons? I'm doing really well. Thanks for having me. I'll go ahead and let you start um, with your presentation. So this semester, students in my History of American Art course began to build an online exhibition history for Oklahoma State. Um, as an institution, we began collecting art in the 1920s, but when I arrived on campus in 2009, most people didn't know about our art collection or our rich history of art exhibitions. So I had the privilege of being the founding curator of the OSU Museum of Art from 2010 to 2014. And during that time, I worked closely with students and faculty to discover and share the permanent collection through exhibitions and research. In fact, um, that was my first foray into digital humanities, digital projects. I began the OSU Art Collection blog in August of 2010 as a way to share our work on the collection and the museum with a broad audience, both on and off campus. Ever since then, I've incorporated hands-on learning with the collection into all my classes. But this spring, when the pandemic struck, I had to think differently about how to engage students with the history of art at OSU. My spring semester students transformed real world museum study room visits into virtual tours. And I was pretty proud of them for being able to pivot so quickly, but because the museum's collection isn't available online, it was difficult for them to create high quality digital resources. So over the summer, I began to think about digital collections on campus that could be useful resources for students uh, and their research in an online teaching environment. I've worked a lot with the oral history program, for example, but I landed on the daily O'Collegian archives because they offered us the opportunity to use an existing resource to create a new research archive, which was a history of art exhibitions at the university. So I did some poking around in the O'Colly archives and I selected a 40 year span, 1960 to 1999, for which I was confident each student could be assigned a year with rich content in it. Then I worked with our digital scholarship librarian, Megan Mackin, Megan created a ModX database for us, which we're looking at here. Um, she trained me and my graduate teaching assistant, JC Irwood, um, and then my students in how to use it. Using the database, students could link articles they found about exhibitions in the Ocali to an exhibition record that also documented related people, artists, organizers, funders, and the exhibition space on campus where it was held. So in this slide, for example, we see a student who used the Ocali article that I had in my earlier slide to create a record for this 1972 exhibition of innovative kinetic sculpture by faculty artist Dale McKinney. Over the course of the semester, I emphasized to my students that we were generating new knowledge about the history of Oklahoma State and by extension about the history of American art. My own research and teaching areas include African American and Native American art history, so I was particularly excited to discover those histories at Oklahoma State. From the late 60s through the 1970s, for example, our exhibition program reflected the vitality and impact of the civil rights movement with multiple exhibitions of African-American art. The photograph here is from the 1969 exhibition, which was organized by Wallace Owens, head of the art faculty at Langston University for many years. When he retired, he founded the Owens Arts Place Gallery in Guthrie, which is an Oklahoma treasure, exhibiting a wide variety of work by predominantly black artists. The students' research also revealed that from at least the 1970s through today, Oklahoma State has consistently exhibited Native American art. What was interesting to me about the shows that the students discovered is that many of them were curated by Native American artists. Today in museums, we talk a lot about the importance of Native self-representation, hiring Native curators to work with collections and communities, and related issues of cultural preservation and repatriation. Thanks to this project, we have new insight into the deep history of Native art exhibitions at Oklahoma State, and I hope to expand on that with my students in the history of Native American art and material culture next fall. Two things really stood out to me over the course of this project. Uh, the first is the value of collaboration. It's still a bit unusual in the humanities, but over the course of my tenure at OSU, I've had the privilege of building a variety of collaborative relationships. And increasingly, I've introduced collaborative projects into the classroom. The digital humanities for me represent a unique opportunity in an online teaching environment because students can easily complete individual work on their own time, but the power of working together is evident in the scope and scale of the project to which their work contributes. In this case, uh, our class of 35-ish students found over 300 exhibitions um, just in that 40-year time period that we were working with. And the second thing that I took away from this project was something that I've really had to learn how to take to heart over the course of the semester. 
Uh, people say you shouldn't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And when people visit our online exhibition history, they'll see mistakes of all kinds. Uh, but I keep reminding myself that they'll also see a rich, diverse art history at Oklahoma State that was completely invisible before. Um, and obviously I would prefer that. I would prefer that they get to see it even though it's imperfect. So the beauty of this project for me is that it's a work in progress and it can grow and be corrected over time, but it's available right now for anyone to explore. And that for me is really exciting. Thank you so much for sharing about this project. It sounds absolutely fascinating. How did you get interested in digital humanities? When did you first hear about it? Um, I've heard about digital humanities for quite a long time. Um, and I think I had heard about it a long time before I really understood what it was. So I thought of it as kind of big data projects. Uh, in some ways I've been working with digital humanities for a really long time because I um, was sort of using digital archives and things like that uh, very early on doing things like um, using digitized texts to do word searches, to do kind of etymologies and things like that. But I didn't really think of it as part of my own research uh, until much more recently. And the first way that it struck me as really useful was uh, because of the way that you can use it to crowdsource information, that it really does reach a lot more people. So before I came to Oklahoma State, I worked at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. And we had one of the first online museum collection databases in the world. But one of the ways that we got it on uh, online so quickly and made it useful was that we actually asked people anywhere, um, but from our museum community to help us tag all of the images with subjects and things like that. So when you go to the Fine Arts Museum's website and you search their online database, you're actually still using the keywords that hundreds of volunteers put in over some period of time. Um, and so you can search for subjects, you can search for artists, but it was really accessible. And so when we started the OSU Museum of Art, I thought, you know, how am I gonna find out about some of these artworks that I know nothing about? And so that's why I started the blog really was to get word out about the project. But also then I wrote little essays and I had students write essays about artworks in the collection about which we knew very little. And we had sometimes the actual artist finding our blog post and saying, oh, hey, that's that's my work and you have the date wrong. Fantastic, we can fix that, right? Like immediately yeah. we get access to people and information that we didn't have before. Relatives of artists, former students, all kinds of people have found us through that. And so for me, the, the digital humanities are exciting because they connect you to people. Right? It's not technology for its own sake, it's technology in order to explain, expand our understanding of each other um, and to connect people. And for me, that's this too. Like I said, it's sort of this invisible history. If you said, hey, did you know we had an exhibition of African-American art in 1969? No one knew that um, yeah. before my student found that, uh, that record. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> so how did you explain digital humanities to your students? I would say, so History of American Art, it's a general education course. Most of the students in the class are not art history majors. And I would say at least half of them are not even in the humanities, right? They're in ag, they're in engineering, they're in architecture. And um, the result of that is that I don't necessarily think that they've formed a concept of what the humanities really means. So, in some ways saying we're gonna do this digital humanities project, it's bringing it closer to tools and research techniques that they understand, like building a database is not an unfamiliar idea to someone coming from the sciences. Um, but I think what was exciting for the students was realizing that we could do this data collection and that transformed into an understanding of society and culture, right? Yeah. That I think that was the surprising bit and the comfort level with the tools, I'm not sure they were any more comfortable with Modex at the beginning than I was. I mean, I was doing a lot of tech support <laughs> with them and I know JC yeah. was as well and Megan. So I think that, you know, the tools, they're not necessarily being surprised by digital tools. And I do feel like some faculty are intimidated by digital tools. Mm -hmm. I'll say I wouldn't have done this project without Megan's help. Um, so it was, it was nice to have someone who was comfortable with the digital side of things. 
um, in terms of that. But but I don't think that the fundamental structures of how we do this research have changed. And maybe that was my hesitation about identifying as someone who worked in digital humanities is I really thought that methods should be more different than they feel to me now. Um, I think because a lot of the early digital humanities work that I was familiar with was really big data type work uh, or GIS based and things where I'm like, I'm not dealing with big, big data sets. I'm not dealing um, with real time information collection. A lot of things that I think of as kind of core to digital humanities. But I was encouraged, uh, you know, in part by Dr. Jennifer Borland, who's the head of the Digital Humanities Initiative, to think more broadly about what digital humanities could be and how that could impact um, my research. And, and I'm grateful for that. Do you think that doing this digital project made the humanities more accessible for your students? I definitely do. I think that's a huge benefit of uh, just digitizing archives in general. Um, I mean, I said at the beginning, the, the collection at the museum is not online. Um, and that really saddens me because I think that we would get much more student engagement with the art collection here at OSU if it was available online. Um, early on when museums started digitizing their collections, there was a lot of fear that if you put your collection online, no one would come to the museum anymore. And the, what they discovered is actually the exact opposite, right? That people, if they could see the collection online, then they had more investment in going to see it in person. And yeah. so museum attendance actually went up. And I think that would happen here. I know that, uh, that every time I engage my students with the museum, they, uh, they then visit on their own afterwards much more than they ever did before. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So you also talked about um, the intimidation of digital humanities. What would you say to someone looking to get into DH? I would say find someone to collaborate with who's not scared of it. <laughs> I mean, I said, you know, Megan, um, I remember our first conversation, I just said, you know, Megan, I have this idea and I don't even know where to begin making it a reality. And we had a meeting in July or August where she just presented me with kind of four different options for how we could build this resource. And it was so reassuring to have someone who was like, oh, I like, I hear what you're saying and I understand what you want and here are the tools you need to do it. And I will walk you through that. I'm sure she had a lot of questions kind of about our side of it, but working together, it was so seamless and so helpful. Yeah. And I just thought like, yeah, we could do this over and over again. I'm really excited <laughs> about uh, building this out with her and working. Absolutely. Thank you so much for letting me interview you. Yeah, it was my pleasure. <laughs>